I am very happy to see you again and I am very happy to welcome some of you that I may not have seen earlier. Just to refresh my memory, would you raise hands if you have heard me before? Thank you. Would you raise hands if you haven't heard me before? Thank you. Would you raise hands if you're not sure? <laughs> Thank you. The title of the talk this evening is When the Time is Right. How many of you feel that certain things in life only happen at a certain time and even though we may try and rush things through, even though we may try to put extra efforts, the things just don't happen till a certain right time comes. Conversely, things just happen even if we try to delay them, we say, no, we can wait, but they still come head on as if they are overwhelming us. How many of you have had that actual experience in life? Will you raise your hands? Oh, thank you. So you understand my lecture already before the <laughs> beginning. I am going to draw your attention to this experience, which is part of our day-to-day -day experience of this life. Some of the things I might mention to you may not fit in with your existing concepts of what is life, what is time, why are we here, why are these events taking place around us. If you feel that what I am saying doesn't fit in with the concept, have patience and look at your own life and see if it makes sense to take a second look at your own life and see whether the events of your life represent a different perception than what you have had from existing concepts. Concepts which the mind builds up are a great hindrance to a clear perception. Some people believe if you have a good concept, you can have good perception. This is not true. What we have found is if you have a good concept, you lose perception. You only perceive if things happen within that concept. So a concept can put you into a groove, can make you start looking at life in the way you are predisposed to look at it because of that concept. And therefore, you may miss a lot of your own life and not perceive it just because of those concepts. These concepts come into our life because of our education, our environment, training, belief systems. So many things happen from childhood onwards. And even though things are in front of us, we say, no, that can't be. It doesn't seem to be possible. This is not like me. No, how can that be? And we rule out the perception that is right in front of us on the basis of the concepts we have already adopted. Therefore, when we want to look at truth about ourselves and the truth of our own life, sometimes we have to put aside any existing concepts, any preconceived notions, any preconceived values. We should be open to look at life as it comes and then see what does it mean. When we look at our life, we find two essential elements. One, consciousness. If we were not conscious or aware, there is no life. That our life consists of our being aware of life. If awareness is cut off, life is cut off. When we say we are living, we are referring to our awareness of life. Whatever we are aware of is our life. What we are not aware of does not form part of our life even if it is around us all the time. Therefore, the first ingredient that constitutes life is awareness or consciousness. The second ingredient of life in this physical world is time. There is a beginning and there is an end to things and something is going on to create events. Something is going on to create birth movement, life, and death. 
that without this movement, without the hanging together of different episodes and different events and different happenings, there would be no life. There is no way in which we can imagine a life without these two ingredients, awareness and time. Let us look at our own life. Do we know anything other than that? Doesn't every bit of our life consist of our awareness of what's happening and when and where it is happening? When there is when and where tagged on to our awareness of what is happening, we say this is life. Whether it is good or bad, whether we like it or don't like it, whether it is suffering or it is happiness, that's immaterial. The important thing is that we need these two ingredients to make for the happening of life. Now, these two ingredients are very essential for physical life as we live it, but they represent two different aspects of the human being. Consciousness represents one aspect and time represents another aspect. Consciousness represents the one who is perceiving, the one who is living, the one who is real, the one who is a spectator, the one who is the experiencer, the one who is the creator, the one who is the receiver, the one who is at the center. And time is the dimension in which that experience takes place, creation takes place, and is therefore outside of that one. Therefore, we are always operating in a combination of a central self, conscious self, and an environment, a frame outside that self consisting of time. Of course, when I use the word time, I include space. You will notice there is very little difference between time and space. Time is the ability of consciousness when it occurs in the form of human attention to say this and this and this. That means to create frequency, to create interruption. When you create interruptions between different episodes or different experiences, you say there is time. This has already happened this is happening now, the rest will happen later. When you divide happenings, when you divide experience linearly, in a linear way, then you say there is time. Space is created the same way, here and there. There could be no here and there if there was no time. If you did not have that interruption in consciousness, the interruption in the use of attention, you could not have space. Space is created when we can see what is near and what is far, what is here and what is there. Here and there or near and far are merely another way of saying now and then. If you study closely, you will find that the difference between time and space is very unreal. They both form part of the same continuum as has been established by some well-known well scientists and philosophers by now. But some of us, except there is a statement like this, there is a continuum of time and space, but we may not personally see the continuum or the interconnection. But if we pause and look at it, it is very easy to see that if attention were not divided into here and there, now and then, there would be neither time nor space. And once this division takes place, both time and space are created. When time and space are created, they create space and possibility of happenings outside of ourselves. Hence comes the question of there is something within and something outside. What is within our own conscious self? What is outside time and space in which these happenings are taking place? If we look at our life, we find we are the self. The conscious self go through a series of events in a time-space continuum outside of ourselves. We do not know anything what is happening inside. We don't even know where is inside. All our attention is focused on this external environment, this external frame 
this external dimension we call time space. When you see these two things, the self which is conscious and a time space which is not conscious but participates in creating experiences for consciousness, then we realize these two make for what is called the positive and the negative modes of life. People say, we have a soul, we have a positive soul, we have a soul which is made of the same essence as God, the Creator. What do they refer to? by saying that we have a soul? They refer to the fact we have consciousness. Consciousness or awareness or ability to open eyes and see, ability to think in the head, the ability to perceive anything, the ability to experience anything, that consciousness is of the same essence as the creator and is called soul or God or whatever you like on the positive side. When you talk of time and space, which are external to you, we are referring to something different. Neither consciousness, nor soul, nor God, nor creator has ever been used to describe that frame in which consciousness is operating. How do we explain that? We call it mind. Now people say, mind, how can mind be equated with time and space? The truth is that the mind only functions in time and space. Because the mind functions through what we call thinking. The thoughts that go in our head constitute the mind. What are these thoughts? These thoughts need time. You can't think if you have no time. There is no way to generate a thought without time. Every thought takes time and thought itself sustains a time. So the time-space continuum is held in place and becomes a reality for us because we have a mind. If we had no mind but only consciousness, there would be no time and space. The thinking process linked to consciousness creates this wonderful stage in which time space come into being and they represent mind. Not too many philosophers could pinpoint this thing. Immanuel Kant of Germany was the first one who said, there is no such thing as mind. When consciousness operates in a framework of time, space and causation, that itself is called mind. In his critique, he made clear that there could be no possibility of a separate thing sitting inside the head, functioning like a thinking machine. There is no thinking machine. When consciousness adopts this posture of going into a law of cause and effect, Everything that happens must be because of something. Everything that is happening must lead to an effect. You create time and space. And therefore, mind was nothing else but the positioning of consciousness in a framework of time, space and causation. Today, if we look at our life, we find that absolutely true. All these thoughts we have, all the intellectual process which we use to acquire knowledge, to acquire information, to grow up in the society, to understand what is happening here or there, what is happening in our lives, is because of this mind which we use to create knowledge of a universe around ourselves, outside of ourselves. Therefore, the mind is what makes an outside and consciousness is what makes the inside. When these masters come to tell us the truth, they give a very simple speech truth to us. They speak in a very simple way. They say the truth is within you. They say the kingdom of God is within you. What do they mean by within? It means if you left the dimensions of the mind and only traveled towards your own consciousness or self, you would find the true kingdom. You would find the truth. Nothing could be simpler than this. I have never seen any simpler message ever recorded, ever displayed, ever given to anybody, ever transmitted in the history of our culture, in the history of hum human beings, except this message. That the reality, your own reality, your own creator, God himself, and your own kingdom 
lies within yourself. Therefore, don't go outside to look for what mind has created. You will not find reality there. Withdraw from there and go to your consciousness and you will find the reality. When we get this message, what do we do? We use the mind to interpret the message. And we say, let us see now to understand this, where else we should go. And we travel to lectures, to church, to workshops. We travel everywhere except within ourselves. Why is that? When the message is so clear that the truth is within ourselves, why do we travel outside? We travel outside because we have identified ourselves with the mind. We have not said the mind is something that is external to us and we are consciousness. We have said the thinking machine which creates time space is us. We have so identified ourselves with our minds that when we want to understand anything, we feel the mind must be used to understand it. If we want to experience something, the mind must be used to experience it. If we want to explain something, the mind must be used to explain something. Therefore, we are relying on thinking as the only source of finding out the truth. And the more we think, the more doubts come up. Because thinking gives us different alternatives. Thinking throws up so many options. And we say, we are not sure if this is right or that is right. In fact, I have had this strange experience during my travels in the world when I have met somebody who is so happy with knowledge and you want to demolish that knowledge, make that person think. After a while, the person is no longer sure of that knowledge. Thinking is such a strange machine. It is such a strange function of the mind that it can create doubt where none exists. It can make you disbelieve what you are seeing in front of you. It can cast doubt and therefore fear out of things which are just shadows. It has happened all the time from childhood till, till our death. We are afraid. Why are we afraid? Because we are in doubt. Why are we in doubt? Because we think all the time. It's very simple. If you look at your own life, you will find this is what is going on. What is the reverse of that? The reverse is, if we identified that thinking is merely a function of physical existence, of physical life, and we need it just to be physically here, and that our real self is consciousness and not the thoughts, and if we could sit in quiet meditation by ourselves, behind the eyes, in our own head, where consciousness operates from, and we draw our attention from our thoughts and contemplate on who we are, we would find the truth without being messed up by the mind. We would even be able to practice the art of becoming witnesses to our own mind. How many of you have practiced this? To sit in your own self and watch the thoughts go by. If you haven't done it, and those of you who are coming to the workshop tomorrow will try it out. I have had such wonderful experiences with people with only this one exercise of sitting together and seeing what their thoughts really are, to hear their own thoughts going in the head, to see their own thoughts pass, and to suddenly discover that those thoughts that they were hearing and seeing were not themselves. It is such a strange thing. People have suddenly been shocked into this reality that we are consciousness, not the thoughts. The thoughts are an experience. The th thoughts are something happening around us and are not us. If we understand that the thoughts are not us, doubt disappears, fear disappears, ignorance disappears. You will be amazed at the amount of real knowledge that exists in consciousness without having to rely upon thought. What's the difference? How does consciousness know something without having to think about it? That particular way of knowledge 
in which consciousness can know without having to think about it is called intuition. When we say suddenly we know it, what is the meaning of suddenly knowing it? There is no suddenness about it. When we say suddenly we know it, we are pulling time out. We are saying we didn't take five minutes to think over it. Suddenly we knew it. There was no time involved. Therefore, no mind involved. Therefore, consciousness just knew as if all the knowledge already exists in the self. And what is messing us up is our identification with the mind and relying upon only, only upon that knowledge which is coming through the intellectual or mental faculties. This is our state. We can get out of the state. But while we are in the state, what happens? We get trapped in a series of events, starting from birth, apparently starting from birth in a particular physical body, growing through various, the pa various pains of childhood and growing up and going through school and getting married, having relationships, getting children, getting old, ultimately dying and quitting. After that, we don't know. We watch other people do that. So we said this is a lifespan. In this lifespan, we find that birth and death are inevitable. Everybody that we know was born. And everybody that we know is dying. Therefore, there is a lifespan in which a number of things are fitted in. And then we look at those things from birth to death. How do those things get fitted in? One person is born rich. Another person is born poor. Why? Who is responsible? Why should one have certain advantages in life? And why should one have disadvantages in life? Who is somebody is born sick? Somebody is born blind? Who is responsible? We try to take a view that this life must be based upon some kind of higher justice. And when we look at the episodes of life, we can't justify it. Jesus Christ was asked when a blind child was brought before him. And people were concerned about sin and punishment. That one is punished for one's own sins. And when the master was asked, why is this child blind? Is he blind because of his sins or the sins of his father? The question came up because he was born blind. How could he have sinned? And how is his father responsible that the child is born blind? And Jesus Christ answered. And he said, neither is he blind because of his sins, nor because of the sins of his father. He is blind so that the law may prevail. And I have seen a lot of theologists trying to explain what that law is. And in the Eastern philosophy, we have harped upon that law over and over again. And that has been called the law of karma. Have you heard that law of karma? What is the law of karma? The law of karma assumes that this life in this physical body is not the life that creates these events. It is the life in the mental body, in the mind, in the thinking mind that creates those events which then take place in the physical body. That unless the mental, mental thinking the mental decision making creates that karma, we cannot have any episode. Therefore, if a child can be born blind, it means the mind pre-exists prior to the birth of the child in the physical body. And therefore, the immediate conclusion was, this is not our only life, that we must have had several lives. And therefore, what is happening now against our will, against our decisions, against our mind must have happened because of what the mind did in a previous incarnation. Hence the law of karma was linked with the law of reincarnation and it was felt that once you have to be born over and over again so that the law may prevail, then you have to go through certain events at the right time depending upon what you have done in the past. If this is so, no wonder things happen in this physical life between our birth and our death, which we cannot explain, for which we are not responsible, which makes so much distinction between one person and another. And they keep on happening at certain times 
out of our control, out of our volition. We have no nothing to do with them, such as accidents taking place, such as illnesses coming to us, such as death taking place, such as birth taking place. These are incidents that are taking place which we do not even plan. And they just come at a time which seems to be predetermined. We are given no chan chance to think about it while we are in this particular body in which those events are taking place. How do we explain them? According to the law of karma, these things are explained as predetermined events arising from our own mental actions of the past. That the mind is continuously acting and therefore making sure that we have a continuous disposition to remain in the outward time and space and causation. And these events transfer themselves from one lifetime to another. They may transfer themselves into a life of a physical human being. They may transfer themselves into a life of a different form. But whatever form they take, the effect of a previous mental action can be felt as a reaction at a particular specified time in the next incarnation. This was widely accepted, very easily accepted. The law of karma is the most widely accepted law in the entire Eastern theology and Eastern philosophy. There is nothing more widely accepted and less questioned. Here it is questioned, reincarnation is questioned. Whether there is any other birth or not is question. But in the East, this is one of the most accepted doctrines because it explains why things happen at a certain time, whether we like them or not. This was the best explanation they could find and has been accepted, that we are in a continuous stream of mental action. And the mind keeps on deciding things and therefore they happen. If this is so, then the human life consists of a number of things that are predetermined by past actions. Is everything fixed by past action or only a few of them? Supposing everything is fixed by past actions, then it will run out very quickly. The past actions can be run off by paying off that karma or living out that karma or getting the rewards and punishments of that karma in one lifetime, two lifetimes, five lifetimes, and that's the end of it. But that is not so. When we look at our own life, we find that certain things happen whether we like it or not. And certain things happen only if we like it. These two types of actions in the present life have been distinguished in the law of karma of the East, and they have been called pralabdha, which means destiny brought from the past, and karaman, or new actions, you are now perpetrating in the mind to create similar events and episodes for the future. Therefore, a distinction is made in the type of karma that is going on in this life, that this life has some positions of destiny. At, age, at birth, age zero, the birth is predestined. There is no element of your decision making in that. Then comes certain incidents which are all predestined because the mother, the father, the other friends, they handle you, you as a little baby. You have no choice. Then the choices start coming up. And more and more space is available in this life when you start what has been called the deliberative process. What is the deliberative process? The deliberative process is the process where mind is being used by consciousness to create decisions. When the mind is used to create decisions, you are now creating new karma, the effect of which can only be seen when fresh destiny is made from those karma. Therefore, our life is full of both kinds of karma. Paying off the past and creating the new. Reaping the fruit of what we sowed earlier and sowing fresh seeds which we will come to reap again. So karma consists of both these actions. And therefore, each one of our lives has things happening 
at a particular time, which we feel we have no control over. And there are things happening which we put so much of our head and attention to, should I or should I not? Should I or should I not? If people want to know what's the difference, something has happened today in my life, was it because of past karma or is it going to be a new karma? What is the answer to that question? The answer is, if what happened today did not involve your deliberative process at all, it was past karma. If it involved your deliberative process today, it's new karma. Therefore, the new karma can be differentiated. The new actions, the new seeds being sown can be differentiated from the old seeds by the fact whether a deliberative process went through your head or not, whether the mind was applied or not. When mind is applied, then these new karma comes up and you have to pay for it. In the Buddhist tradition, they believe that space and time precede this physical world. That means our physical experience in a physical body is preceded by an experience in time and space in which we can view what has already been sown earlier. So that we can, if we like, have a look at what, what is possible to happen in future lives. That huge space or a fundamental space or a huge nothingness or an emptiness from which everything can come has been referred to as the sunna or nothingness, but not emptiness, but nothingness. Emptiness. Nothingness from which everything can come, not emptiness which has nothing in it. So that nothingness by Buddhist tradition has a space and time in which everything is held so that when we bring it back as destiny into a physical human life, we only pick up some parts of that. The Dalai Lama, holiness Dalai Lama, who is the Buddhist teacher whom I had the good fortune to meet and live with and share views with for a couple of years in Dharamsala in India. He and I discussed the nature of nothingness at length and how deep does the impression of deliberativeness here go into nothingness. Supposing a casual thought comes to us, should I have coffee or not today? Should I have coffee? Maybe I shouldn't have coffee. Maybe I've had too much coffee. It has caffeine. Maybe I shouldn't have, but I'd like to have. Let me not have it. Let's take this little deliberation. According to his knowledge of that wide space and wide sky in which all this is being imprinted, it is impossible not to have coffee in the future if I have done that much deliberation. Whether I take that coffee after a year, two years, five years in this life, in the next life, or after a million years, that impression is registered in a way it cannot be wiped off. Such is the nature of that big space. We have given it different names to the big space in which nothingness is not nothing. Our desires, our deliberate thoughts are engraved and they create a permanent impression, setting up setting into motion a series of destinies we can make for ourselves from there. That particular sky or akash, akash means sky, represents the records of all possible human deliberation. And therefore, it has sometimes been referred to as the akashic or the akashic records. What are the akashic or akashic records? They are nothing but our own destinies planted there by ourselves. And having done that, now we have a choice to pull some of them down. Why don't they all fall upon us? Because there are so many, they can't fit into a normal human life. What happens to the rest of all those impressions if only a few of them come and constitute the destiny of a human life in which milestones of predetermined accidents and actions are there and in between enough room is left for more deliberation. What happens to the rest of all those? Those are held as reserve karma and have been given the title of sinchit karma. Sinchit means reserve. They're kept in reserve and are never wiped out. Therefore, 
we have such a huge treasure house of special decisions recorded there that if we decided let's not think anymore and get out of this mess, it will take millions of lifetimes just to wipe out what is already there. Therefore, this is not a short way to get out of these predetermined actions that come in our life from time to time. We have to find some other method. They are too much. So, these three kinds of karma, the predestined things that come into our life at the right time and we can do nothing about it, is called destiny or pralabdha. The open spaces, open mental spaces between those incidents, which give us the freedom of thinking, deliberating, decision making, choosing between options, which constitute the karma and karma, and the huge reservoir of previously imprinted records in the Akash, which represents Sinchit, these three are enough to keep us going on a merry-go-round forever. That's why this life that we look at is not such a simple affair, that we've just been born and we have a life to live, we don't know why we are living, we can make some decisions, some goals in this life and then achieve those goals or not achieve the goals and die, we don't know what happens. It's not that simple. It's such a continuous game. It's a very interesting merry-go-round, but it's a merry-go-round. It's a very interesting way of experiencing life in different forms, but it's a continuous experience. Now, it is obvious that if this is already working and we are in the midst of it today, do we like it? Is it a good arrangement or is it not a good arrangement? When we evaluate it, when we want to put a judgment on it, what's going on as life, is it good or bad? Then we look at it from another angle. Are we happy? Then we look at a different aspect of consciousness. If we are happy, we say, this is great, life is great. And if we find we are unhappy, the pressure is of the suffering, unhappiness, we say, oh, hell, this is bad. We should get out of it. Therefore, life by itself has the elements of happiness and unhappiness and all these milestones already posted. But what makes us like to live this life or get out of it is the fact whether we are happy or unhappy. One man went to look around how many happy people there were. When he went out, he saw people nicely dressed up going and buying their groceries, having good food to eat, driving automobiles, going to movies and theaters, carrying greenbacks in their pockets, notebooks, writing out big checks. He says, this world is a very happy place. Everybody looks happy. Look the way they dress up, the way they go shopping, the way they go entertaining, the way they go partying. This must be a very happy place. When he went to meet each one, each one of those participants in this happy world individually and began to talk to them individually, they started crying how unhappy they were, that they were beaten down in the competition, that people have disappointed them, that they knew no other pain like the pain of emotional suffering, that the unhappiness of loneliness was so overpowering they had never been able to talk to anybody. So when that investigator went into individual cases, he found everybody was unhappy. And he said, why should everybody be unhappy? Outwardly, when we are together, we are happy. Individually, we are unhappy. Why? And he found the reason for this. Individually, we are lonely, alone. Outwardly, we are trying to overcome that loneliness. All the steps that we think are making us happy are efforts to overcome that loneliness. And therefore, they look happy because these are efforts to overcome loneliness. And when they do not overcome loneliness, we are again unhappy. This was a strange finding. That means when we are in our own conscious self, we are lonely and unhappy. Then we try to overcome that loneliness by becoming happy in the company of others. This is strange because this is how the whole world is running. If we look at our own way of conducting our lives, 
conducting our deliberative process, how we make decisions. We are making our decisions in pursuit of happiness and every effort we make to pursue happiness is by trying to overcome loneliness. Whether we buy an auto or we buy a home or we make friends or we marry or have children or go do, doing politics or social work or religion, any work that we do with the de deliberative process is an attempt to overcome the loneliness of our single consciousness. So it was found that the real problem of this life, of this world, was not the problem whether you are rich or poor. Rich and poor did not make for happiness or unhappiness. The rich looked happy to the poor, but looked very unhappy to the other rich. The rich looked happy to those who didn't have what they had, but they were very unhappy emotionally for those who had emotional happiness. In fact, I personally conducted a survey myself when I was a student right in this state at Harvard University in Cambridge way back in the 60s. And that was conducted as, as a survey for business management. I was going to business school here. And the Harvard Business School was horrified when I said I am going to test out some theories on happiness. This is what is that to do with business? I said a lot. If you can find the secret to happiness, you can do good business. Everybody wants it. But the relevant part of that survey was that people who had certain physical, tangible assets, which made them look like happy people to others who did not have those physical, tangible assets, were very unhappy when it came to the intangible assets like emotional stability, like spiritual contentment, like happiness in a relationship, things which are not tangible. A person could be a multimillionaire and his heart was broken. He could never get happiness from those multimillions. This was discovered that there was nobody who was having happiness in all the spheres. Therefore, unhappiness was universal. One of the Indian mystics 500 years ago said something beautiful. His name was Guru Nanak. Guru Nanak said, Nanak dukhya sab sansar so sukhya jis namadhar. Nanak, I have discovered that everybody is unhappy. I have gone around and found out that everybody is unhappy, except the one who has found the secret of that happiness within oneself. He gave a good answer. He said the secret of happiness is not by using the space-time mind outside and changing the conditions outside. There must be a secret of finding happiness within. He gave the same solution, which all masters had given. Go within. The true happiness is within, not outside. All these events, all the karma. Some people have sometimes asked me, this karma you speak of, is this karma real? Or is it an illusion? So, they wait with their abated breath what I am going to say. So if I say it is illusion, they heave a sigh of relief. Thank God. But by saying thank God, they don't get out of karma. <laughs> because they don't get out of the very thing which is creating karma, which is the mind, time and space outside. Karma, free will, decision making, time, past, present and future, mind, mental activity, intellect, they all are one package. You cannot say karma is unreal, the rest is real. The moment you have any one of these and consider it real, the rest becomes real. You cannot say I have a mind and I can make up my mind and decide what is right and what is wrong. But karma is unreal. It's not possible. Because that very faculty by which you decide this is right, this is wrong. This is good, this is bad. I am going to do this, I am not going to do that. This very faculty is creating karma. Therefore, if you have any one of these things, karma becomes real. But there have been teachers, masters, mystics, especially in the East, and of course in many other places also, 
but we know historically a large number of them who came in the east, in the Middle East, in the Far East, and some of them you might find in the West coming now, who have made a statement and indicated a way which is very promising. They have said that human consciousness can identify itself as separate from mind, as separate from this paraphernalia of time, space, causation. And by so identifying, it can reach a level of awareness which transcends the mind, therefore transcends this framework. They have said this is not only a philosophic postulate, it is not a hypothesis, it is something we can practice. And they have said the way to practice is not an unnatural way reserved for some specially gifted people, it is a way that has been provided in our consciousness by the Creator Himself. Therefore, anyone who gets the secret information and the secret knowledge that the way out of the entanglement of the mind is available in consciousness can take advantage and transcend the mind. If one transcends the mind, one transcends karma. Karma stops where mind stops. If one can transcend this, the whole subject that I have mentioned of unhappiness, loneliness, trying to overcome loneliness, going backwards and forwards in time, creating karma, having deliberations, all that is wiped out in a single personal experiencing of the nature of the self, the nature of consciousness, which can exist in a state of bliss beyond happiness and unhappiness, in a state of knowing beyond intellectual understanding, which will resolve all these problems that are arising by our living the life of the mind and not our own life, which is the life of consciousness. Who has made these statements? These human beings like us. Maybe some other people are making statements somewhere else. We don't know. We have to wait for channeling. We have to wait for people to come and speak through other people. We have to wait for some dreams to come tell us. We don't know about it. Our mind may be playing a, a fool. A mind may be deceiving us. But there are human beings who don't channel or anything from their experience. They come and share with us that you can have an experience by which you overcome this mental game and you can rise above the mind and know that your own self can be freed from all these problems that we talk of. They are called the perfect living masters, the perfect adepts, the perfect mystics of the highest order. Why do, they, why do we address them as perfect living masters? Because they have reached the perfection of going above the mind. All imperfections come from the mind. Having gone above the mind, we call them perfect. They are living because they are in the same form as we are. So we can talk to them and even though we may be entangled in our own minds, at least we can question them and get some answers to our questions and proceed in a systematic way to understanding ourselves, they are living human beings like us. And they are masters because they have the awareness of that higher level. Such people have always existed and will continue to exist. They are the link between the truth and our untruth of the mind here. Our meeting such people is a great event. Because if we do not meet such a person, and keep on thinking about reality, about God, about what we can do. We are getting, we are really going in circles with the very thing that is keeping us here. When we discover that the mind creates time and space and the mental decisions keep us going round and round, including creating karma, then how can we find the truth with the mind? The mind is the one that is keeping us away from the truth. How can we use the same mind to find the truth? The only service the mind can perform is when it goes round and round, round and round and then says, I can do nothing more, now find some other way. 
It's not a mental game. Spirituality is not a mental thing. It's not intellectual. Find something else. That's the best contribution mind can make. But then find what? Who is going to tell us? Who is going to introduce us to a state of consciousness which we have shut off long ago and are going round and round in this mind time space continuum? Such persons who have already gone to that state can share it with us and we call them perfect living masters. How do we meet a perfect living master? How can we find such masters? Now, if we use the same mind to investigate, to interrogate, to look for those masters, we may never find them. Because if they are really perfect living masters, they should be perfectly like us. If they are not like us, the mind doesn't accept them. You will notice that our mind is so constructed that it puts itself on top that we have to be satisfied before we can accept. The mind starts with this premise. I must be satisfied this is the real thing before I'll take the next step. Now, if the mind is to be satisfied and the mind doesn't want to get out of its own mind game, it can always create the reasons for dissatisfaction. Now, look at the people who have been searching for truth through the mind. I have met people who have searched for 10 years, 20 years, 40 years. They're still searching. Old people, professors, seekers, people who are playing mind games, people who are in mind societies, high thinking, positive thinking, this kind of thinking, this kind of life stream, this kind of mind stream, this kind of various mind games. And they have been thinking, thinking hard and trying to grab that reality through that mind and all their life has passed and they have not achieved it. The reason is simple. They are using the same thing which is keeping them here. How can you let the mind which is determined to keep its own empire going seek something that will lead to its own annihilation? Therefore, the mind by itself cannot lead to this. Intellectual process or thinking, which is purely a mental function, cannot lead to spiritual realization at all. Therefore, if the mind has to evaluate a person and say, is this person a perfect living master? Give the mind a chance and the mind will say, no. You try it out. Give the mind a full chance. Investigate if there are any perfect masters in this world. Go everywhere. Say, we've got a list of 40 people who claim to be the masters. Let's investigate them. The mind will come home and say, none of them are perfect. You can try it. It is the nature of the mind. Don't blame it. Then how can, what is the function in consciousness that supersedes this mental seeking and can still create an awareness that convinces us there is a master? Those functions which take place in consciousness and the mind cannot reproduce are the functions that resolve this issue. One of those functions is intuition, a sudden knowledge, gut knowledge, a feeling, an experience by which you can say, I know it. I don't know how I know it. I can't explain how I know it, but I know it. That kind of knowing which comes suddenly can be a key. But the mind can very quickly destroy that knowledge. Have you ever had a hunch or intuition like that? Anybody? Please raise your hand if you ever had that. Thank you. So you understand what I'm saying? That sudden intuition. And my experience has been that when the intuition is strong and is very clear, the mind starts thinking about it and wipes it out and says, how can you trust such intuition? Has that ever happened? So you understand what I am saying, that give the mind its freedom and it will crush even the intuitive knowledge which may be perfectly real. The number of people I meet who say, I wish I had trusted my hunch. I wish I had trusted my gut knowledge. It's so much, so many. that I wonder, how can you let the mind play so much havoc with your life? But the mind plays this havoc. Therefore, intuition, which can give us this help, is crushed by the mind. 
What else is left? There is another thing that happens in consciousness which the mind cannot duplicate. And that is called love. Love is a wonderful thing. Love is such a beautiful thing. Love is the only thing that can put the mind to sleep though temporarily. I have never seen anything which is able to control the mind except love. If you have found something, tell me. I have not found anything which can take the ego and put it in second place. The ego which is the front face of the mind which says, I know it, I can resolve it, I can think over it, I know what to do, I have to be satisfied that I, I, I will always be I in every endeavor, in every seeking, in every struggle, except when it comes to love and the I disappears and you becomes important. There is no other human experience so powerful as love in order to put the mind aside and let us see what is the truth. Therefore, these mystics, these perfect living masters, when they come, they do not employ the intellectual method to tell us how to deal with the mind. They go along with us, with the mind, so that we become friends. They go along with our life so that we may give time to see what happens. And then they come with their real method, which is love. When they draw us with their love, the ego and mind is put aside and they can show us the truth and we can listen to our intuition. If any one of you has had spiritual upliftment, a spiritual realization, a feeling that you know what is real, have you not felt it like that? Was it not this route that we followed? The route of love, intuition coming up and putting the mind in place and understanding mind is not you. The perfect living masters have relied upon love as their method. And love is the only method that these masters have used. Now, it becomes very simple that if these masters come and use love as their method to give us their message, then they must be ordinary people like us. Beset with the problem of the mind, we cannot have love except with an ordinary person like ourselves. Supposing a master came, I've often given this example, if a perfect master came in an extraordinary way, supposing he came and walked in this room three feet above the ground to show he's a master, because if he walked on the ground, we may not notice him. Supposing he wants to show he's extraordinary and walks three feet up in the ground and comes and says, here I have come, the master. And we are all sitting here looking for a master. What will be our reaction? We look in, in disbelief. Is he holding stilts? Is there a game going on? What kind of trick is this? Is there jugglery? Is he a magician? Supposing we find that he's actually walking in the air, we'll be struck with awe, with fear, with wonder, even with worship, but not with love. I've never seen love being generated by that experience. Never. This extraordinary ex experience which such a person may display will generate a lot of feelings in us, but not the feeling of love. Supposing while he is showing this extraordinariness here, he trips over space and falls down here. Stan will be the first to come and pick him up. And then Marge will run. Sir, are you hurt? And love will be born in their heart at that very moment. Do you understand the nature of love? The nature of love is to love one who is like us. Why is that? Because when you come to understand love, even intellectually, you find what is happening when you love somebody. What is happening is an identification with that person. When you see yourself in that person and that person in you, that is love. Love automatically makes you identify with the beloved. You begin to feel so close, you are so similar, you are so alike, you are one, you are now different. This feeling comes so strong in love and comes in nothing else. There is no other comparison that can make one feel so much like the beloved as love. All intellectual comparisons will show the differences. Supposing you are in love with a person and you feel so much alike 
then start an intellectual analysis of how similar you are, you will find all the differences and fight over it. <laughs> Therefore, love is an automatic, conscious, intuitive, timeless faculty happening within us which identifies with the other. Therefore, if we are ordinary, the beloved has to be ordinary. Therefore, if we are ordinary, the perfect living master who may be extraordinary in his consciousness must be ordinary as we see him caught up in our day-to-day -day affairs here. That is why if you see the history of spirituality, the history of spiritual masters all over the world, you will find they came like ordinary human beings. Not only ordinary human beings, so ordinary that we abused them. We crucified them. We killed them. We did everything we could do with an ordinary person. If we had taken them as extraordinary, we wouldn't have done that. They showed their ordinariness so that they could plant in our hearts the love that was essential to transmit the spiritual message. So this ordinary people who come in our life, then if they have to come in our life, they must also come according to the same pattern of karma that I was talking of earlier. The truth is, they do come according to our karma. Therefore, just like everything else that happens in our destiny at the right time, their entry into our life is also at the right time. People often ask me this. We believe in your proposition that we need a perfect living master. We need somebody who's really enlightened. We need somebody who has gone above, transcended the mind, so that he can give us the clue and take us along to the realm of reality. But how do we find him? That's the big problem. And my answers have not always satisfied people. My answer is a simple one. You can't find him. And naturally, it doesn't satisfy people. And I have said you can't find that person because the process of finding is a mental process. What can you do then? You can be ready. You can make yourselves ready to be found. That you can do. That is why it was never suggested by any of the masters, go find. They said, seek. Seek and you will find. Don't find and you will find. Seek and you will find. What's the difference? Seeking is a state of preparedness in the heart. Finding is going around in the time, space, mental continuum outside. You can't run around this world and find a perfect living master. I haven't seen people doing that. I have seen people who spent 30, 40 years traveling to every country, looking at all the books that they could find and evaluating different kind of teachers, yogis and sadhus and philosophers and psychics. They got big lists of biographies of various people. They went all over, couldn't find. And then suddenly, while boarding a bus, by strange coincidence, they met somebody who was the master. They never tried to find that person. But the fact that they struggled so hard and were seeking internally in their heart made the master come to them through a means which is not called finding. It is called coincidence. How many of you have seen this experience of coincidence? Will you raise your hands if you had a notable coincidence in your life? Thank you. So you understand what I'm saying. A coincidence is not something that you planned. A coincidence is not something that you mentally worked out. A coincidence is not a goal that you set for yourself. If you set a goal, it's not a coincidence. A coincidence is that which happened when your goal was something else. A coincidence was that which came on the way that happened by itself. It is as spontaneous, as sudden, as timeless as spaceless as intuition. There's no difference. A coincidence outside and intuition inside is the same. Now, I did a little survey once with some of the seekers of truth who are very happy because they are on the path of spirituality. And I was amazed to find another coincidence. And the coincidence was that those who had external coincidences also had internal hunches and they both fitted in together. That's a great coincidence. 
that a person should have an intuitive feeling, this is going to happen. And says, no, no, how can it happen? And then it happens outside where there is no control. It's just coincidence. When I have found people finding the perfect living master, I have been amazed at the way they have found through coincidence rather than finding. So coincidence is a very important part. It is so important, it has been called the language of God. People say, we want to follow God. We don't want to follow our mind. If we follow our mind, we become man books, the followers of the mind. We want to follow the guru or God, master. We want to be followers of the truth. But we don't know what God is saying. We try to hear him. And in between, sometimes we hear God's voice. And sometimes in the middle of the sentence, we suddenly suspect that voice looks too familiar. Looks like our own mind's voice. How can we say? People who say we hear voices in our head and God speaks to us are fooling themselves. It's the same voice that the mind speaks to them every day. How can God speak to them in the same voice their thoughts are speaking? And how can they ever find out? If mind represents this negativity of creation and negativity of merry-go-round of karma and continuous birth and rebirth and consciousness, the self represents God. How can we rely upon the voice of that mind in our head and say we are hearing God's voice? That's not God's voice. That's the mind's voice. Therefore, how do we distinguish? And these mystics have said, God speaks through coincidence and not through the mental voices in your head. When things happen suddenly, you never expected them. Watch out. God has given you a message. When coincidences happen in your life, watch out. God has given you a message. Learn the language of God. Learn the language of coincidences rather than the thoughts that are generated in your own head. There was one Arabic mystic, Rumi, Maulana Rum, sometimes we refer to him, writing very nice poetry. In one of the poems he says, I wonder why people can't understand what is God's will. They come to ask me. We want to live in God's will, but we don't know what is his will. And I have to tell them, man, if God has given a spade in your hand, he has expressed his will. Dig. What more do you want? If he has created a circumstance around you, out of your planning, not your planning. If he has created the circumstance, which is the same as coincidence in your life, he has expressed his will. Follow that. Live that. Therefore, when we enter into the com company of these perfect living masters, they teach us in such simple ways how we can live a life that is willed by the creator and our own consciousness and not willed by the negative force of the mind and the circumstances around which has been created by the mind which generate this life. All these events that happen, happen at the right time. Right time is another way of describing coincidence. People plan, I'll do this in five years. And something happens at another point in time by coincidence. That is the right time. People wait for the right time. And they say, I'm waiting for so long for the right time. I stopped waiting and the right time comes. I don't know how many of you have had these experiences. These experiences are one man sat in meditation. A friend of mine, he said, I tried very hard to meditate and to find, to see God's face. I meditated very hard. I heard that if I meditate, I will get glimpses of light. I will hear some resounding music. I will get, get access to something that is real. And I tried very hard. The harder I tried, the more dark it was. And my own images that I was trying to make would not justify saying that God is showing himself. I have tried very hard and one day I gave up. I said, God, it's not in my power. And that very night when he was relaxing in meditation, the light came and the sound came. What was going wrong? It was the same meditation. But the very fact he was trying hard and saying he can fix the time and it will happen, made it not happen. 
Therefore, the right time is even more important than the planned time that we can put into spiritual achievement and spiritual experience. The right time is predetermined by a series of karma. The karma can be read when we have the spiritual experience in the sky of nothingness, in the Akashic records, when we rise above the physical, above the sensory, into a plane where we can see our mental activity of the past, present and future. If you practice this kind of meditation where you can withdraw your attention from the physical body, take it to a pure mental plane and look at that plane and how you have come through that plane, you will find that your entire life has been pre-recorded there. Even the decisions you are making are pre-recorded there. One gets sometimes surprised how we got these lives here, different kind of patterns. People come, they are born in different situations. We are soul, pure consciousness. How did we get into this mess in the first place? When we had no karma. Karma is created by the mind. What happened before we got mind? What happened before we got into this physical incarnation? As pure spirit, as pure soul as pure consciousness. How did we have any karma to start with? If you want an answer to this question, the answer can be found at the mental causal level of consciousness which one can access by withdrawing attention from the physical and sensory consciousness through a proper system of meditation. If you get access to that, you will find that life in all its permutation and combinations Every possible type of package, life starting from birth to death of different combinations is available almost like going to a video library and picking out a cassette and playing it. What we are doing now is playing the cassettes of our choice. We pick them up. Nobody else did it. Therefore, although it looks strange how we did it, but the thing was that once we picked up a cassette, we were strung on to all the serial that went with it. Almost like a soap opera, soap show in the TV. Once we got on, every day, next life, next life was a link with the previous one. Once we picked up that at the mental level and started a life in the sensory and physical realm, we continued a process which created karma after karma and went on. Unless we return the cassette there, we can't undo, undo the damage we have done to ourselves. This is a statement that can be verified. This is not a philosophy. This is a statement that can be verified through a meditational practice that gives us access to that part of the mental realm called the Akashic Records called the records of all possible permutation combinations of events that constitute human life and how we picked up one and we think that now we are trapped in it and we can't get out. That awareness comes at that level. We are responsible even for setting up the time of these things. We are responsible even for setting up the time of our liberation. In that sense, the entire structure of this universe, the entire structure of life has been made by us from there. If we have access to that knowledge, then we can understand everything, including our good thoughts, including our seeking, including finding, is taking place just at the right time. What happens if we get that kind of awareness? We get a mode or an attitude in consciousness which is considered very superior in spirituality. And that is called the attitude of acceptance. Have you ever heard that acceptance? Acceptance is considered a great spiritual virtue. Acceptance is considered a great spiritual virtue. Why is it considered a virtue? Because it shows that we can have that awareness that all has been set to happen at the right time. And we should accept as it happens. Acceptance is not a passive thing. Acceptance does not mean don't do a thing. 
Acceptance means if you have to do a thing, do it. Do it in the best way. If you don't have to do it, don't do it. Withdraw in the best way. Acceptance is accepting the language of coincidence and circumstances that comes to our life. Only selecting this portion of spiritual lessons, leading a life of acceptance, leading a life in which we take things as they come at the right time, has given transformed unhappiness into happiness. Would you like to try? Try it for a week. Sometimes people say my suggestions are too simple, that therefore they are not acceptable. I should make them more complex. This is so simple that if we say from tomorrow, we are going to try out what happens if we lead a life of acceptance. Acceptance means we accept what is happening is happening by our choice and we have laid it down. Everything will happen in the right time and we are supposed to do what circumstances and coincidences tell us to do. Let's do it with vigor, with courage, with all the force at our command, but not going outside what the circumstances and coincidences tell us. We accept what the will is and let's do it. Try for one week, unhappiness gets converted to happiness. Therefore, happiness is not very far away. Happiness is when we withdraw from the mental activity, when we withdraw from the space we have created outside, which makes us deliberate upon doing or not doing, to accepting, and we get the inner happiness that these masters have spoken about. I have strayed from the subject of the time is right to many other things, just to share the experiences of the East with you. But I want to conclude by saying that in the spiritual path, the time is right. Therefore, the utmost importance should be given to patience, to seeking, and to accepting. If we can develop these virtues of patience, seeking within, and accepting, the time is right for us now. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, I shall be very happy to answer. Those who are coming to the workshop tomorrow are free to raise uh, any questions tomorrow in the workshop. As I have said earlier, when I invite questions, I do not limit them to the presentation made. You can ask questions about what I have said. You may also ask questions about what I have not said. So you are free to ask any kind of questions. Yes. Has there really changed since the harmonic conversions? There's change taking place every day. When uh, that particular date came and people asked me, is there going to be a change? I said, I see the change every day. But the thing is, there is an August 16th for each one of us, and it's not the calendar August 16th. So what happened is that for some people, the change was that day. For some people, the change is today. For some people, the change will be tomorrow. Change is taking place all the time. When a person gets the enlightenment, that's a big change. There are some events in life which are such a big change that there is nothing that can compare with them. And I have sometimes thought over it. What is the biggest change that can take place in a human being's life? And I came to the conclusion, the biggest change is the day that human being starts seeking in the heart. And that, that has happened several times. People have suddenly been thrown into a life in which they became seekers. The biggest change, because once you are a seeker, there is no going back. It's a very big change. It's a very big event in one's life. Another big event is, probably even more important event is, to come face to face with a perfect living master. Once you do that, your journey beyond the mind is assured. It's such a big, it's such a big effect. It may not come immediately. It comes and folds as we go along. Another big event is when a perfect living master accepts us or initiates us and becomes a partner or a co-traveler on the spiritual journey within. Then all these experiences we read about in the books become our experiences. It's a very big change in us. 
ultimately the the highest change is when we ourselves experience a consciousness above the mind it's a very big experience we go into a reality of which we have only heard and talked about and then we have a personal experience of it all these are very big changes in one's life but sometimes people refer to a certain date to indicate other changes happening generally on the planet and this was one of the matters that came up whether a general transition is taking place and people are becoming more spiritual especially in certain parts of the planet then the answer is yes i say it on the authority of my teacher the great master who said long ago 50 years ago that such a change will be coming and the change really involves a shift in the spiritual seeking in a big way from the east to the west which is happening now i am a witness to that i have been uh, studying in this university in the 60s in harvard i have come on lecture tours several times and i am now working here and why did i run over here and start working with that guy who was sitting there in his vegetarian health company the real reason was not that i wa- uh, liked his cookies or something the real reason was i knew these changes are coming and big developments including the presence of perfect living masters in large numbers in this part of the world is going to come now and therefore i just ra- ran here to grab the best ringside seat i could get so these changes are taking place and a lot of changes and you will see all of them with your own eyes but the change that is important for us is the change that takes place in ourselves it's nice to see changes taking place generally outside it is nice to see spirituality travel in an area which was beset only with the with the mind with the mental phenomena with understanding with intellect with books and to find true spirituality coming up there but it is not equivalent to the realization of truth that comes inside our own selves so let's wait for the change and seek that change don't find the change seek that change by seeking inside the change is coming yes do uh, perfect living masters know that they are perfect living masters and do they declare themselves as such they know they are perfect living masters but they don't declare themselves as such they don't declare themselves as such because they come like ordinary persons in our lives and we discover their perfection as we go along on the path of spirituality there is a story of a king who went to look at the condition of his subjects and he went straight into a forest and he found a woodcutter a poor woodcutter who used to cut logs of wood and sell them in the market to make a living the king saw his condition and he said look if i told you i am the king and i could take good care of you what would you say he said i would call you a liar i wouldn't believe you if you were the king you would be sitting on a throne you wouldn't be coming here in the forest to live in the same place where i am so the king tried another method he became a woodcutter with him and when they became friends and they had love for each other and respect for each other then the king said I have some connections in the palace. Should I take you? I have some connection with the doorman. We can get in. He said, "I don't believe you can have that connection." But when they went to the palace and the king gave the sign and the doors were opened, he said, "Why didn't you tell me? You had so much connection." And gradually they went inside and the king said, "I have some connection with the ministers here and the secretaries. I can take you in the inside." He said, "I don't believe it." But when the king did take him inside, He said I didn't know you were such an influential man. I did suspect but I couldn't believe it. Eventually he goes to the throne and the king says I can introduce you to the king. And he goes and sits on the throne. And says I am the king. He says if you were the king why didn't you tell me in the forest? He said that's where I started off from. But you said I am a liar. The strange thing about the mind is that uh, we we do not accept these statements. and therefore the masters perfect living masters come like ordinary persons befriend us live our life become like us and from there raise us to the level of awareness from where they come so 
although they make it plain to us when we realize them that they are the masters they start by becoming friends like ordinary people yes does one loving master recognize another loving master yes they do yes what word is the right way you feel that we have any control over <laughs> our destinies in other words if we feel we know what we were put here to do this time the fact that we picked it but we do know um, and a series of life experiences lead us off the road to where we are heading to right do we have any do you feel that we have any control over those things uh you must have seen some play on a stage have you ever seen a play on a stage does the actor who is playing his role on the stage does he have, have any control over what he is doing yes over his lines can he change them exactly so does he have any control he does but he won't change the lines how does that happen that here is a person who chose to be an actor he had control not to act at all we made our destinies but having made and started the lines we seem to have got into the lines and we don't want to get out of it why don't we turn the lines around because a good actor on the stage supposing he were while acting turn around to the audience and say look this is not real i'm just acting <laughs> what would happen he would destroy the very play and what makes him not destroy the play is not himself but the audience if the audience is watching the play the actor acts as well as if that is real he forgets who he is in real life he acts the stage the adopted lines as if that is real and thinks he has no control he has to go according to the lines the script is all written the script of the play does not allow for any change he has deliberately got into an act where he is acting a role with no change in the script for the sake of the audience if the audience is a rough audience in a village in uh, in asia in an asian village i have seen plays where actors keep on reminding people don't forget i am the village barber tomorrow you have to come to me they keep on making these comments and the villagers have paid only one dime to see the play and then i come to broadway and see people buying 55 dollars 65 dollar tickets and the actor will not budge even a little bit and he will bring his tears bring his emotions bring his facial contortion exactly in line with what he's supposed to be doing which is not his real self he will lose all control and think the play is controlling him why because the audience paid 65 dollars a ticket and it's not the same kind of play in this world we are all on a big stage that's why we are acting out our part who is the audience in this game where we are all acting here who is the audience the audience is our own totality the audience is all of us the audience is consciousness in its totality which another one word given for this expression consciousness in totality the other word is god god is the audience of a created play and we are the different points of view of god functioning like individuals in a play if god is the audience if the totality of us is the audience there could be no more sophisticated audience that you could find anywhere therefore the question of our deviating from the line doesn't arise at all so sure have we made that we do not deviate from the script from the lines that we have forgotten that it's a script we take it as real this is how we ensure that we play these lines exactly as they are written destiny has been made by us we have full control over it but having started playing out the destiny we have shut ourselves from that role in order to make this act as real as possible and the illusion look as real as possible ultimately why has this been done for the same reason which i mentioned in the beginning to overcome loneliness